Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're talking about a very recent discovery of the first ever really really large planet orbiting around a really really small star, a typical white dwarf. So once upon a time our sun is going to look sort of like this. It's going to be still um, not really that small in terms of mass, it's going to lose a little bit of mass but not a lot, but it's going to be earth sized and it's also going to be extremely extremely bright. It's going to be what's known as a white dwarf. This will happen in um, a few billion years from now, possibly about 6 billion years. And by then, the um, planet Earth will probably no longer exist. Mostly because before this stage, our sun is going to expand dramatically and very likely swallow, or at least seriously, scorch our beautiful planet. So, in that sense, it's not going to be a very exciting time for any life on Earth. But it's still quite exciting to find out new things about these unusual remnants. So White Dwarf is basically a kind of a final stage for many different stars similar to our Sun, and it's going to stay in this stage for a tremendously long time. As a matter of fact, um, even though it doesn't actually have any nuclear reaction anymore, the White Dwarf itself cools down extremely slow. At some point, and we can actually demonstrate this, by using Universe Sandbox, um, it's going to start cooling down and will eventually reach a point when it's going to become what's known as a Black Dwarf. But because all of the uh, calculations we have today suggest that this takes trillions and trillions of years, um, we don't think these exist yet, because our universe is just not old enough. But anyway, so that is the natural of what White Dwarfs are. There's quite a lot of them around, and the nearest one to us is known as Sirius B. But at a distance of about 1500 light years away from us is this white dwarf with a peculiar name that you can find right here and about uh, which you can read more in the description below. So essentially this white dwarf is pretty far away from us, and just like many other white dwarfs, seems to possess this right here, a kind of a accretion disk, or basically disk of matter around it. We've discovered various disks and various rings around white dwarfs, and we usually think that they're formed by, well, remember how I mentioned planet Earth is going to suffer when our sun expands? That. They're usually created by the destructive forces, tidal forces, from the expanding red giant stars. And we think that many of these planets eventually start coming closer and closer to a white dwarf that they used to orbit around. So basically this right here, Sirius B, um, will or already has created a bunch of rings or um, accretion disks around itself. In essence, we expect all of the white dwarfs to have very similar sort of structure and very similar um, evolution. But at the same time, we always discover something we never really expected, and this is exactly what just happened. When looking for the um, types of material that was orbiting around various white dwarfs out there, and specifically approximately 7,000 of them, the scientists behind the study discovered that one of them was somewhat peculiar, because it seemed to have a lot more material around this particular white dwarf, and even though we expect the actual solar winds to blow it all out and have it disappear over time, it didn't seem to happen in this case. Or actually, that's not entirely true. A lot of gas did leave the system, but a lot of it seemed to have also been falling into the star. Specifically, about 3000 tons of material of oxygen, sulfur, and hydrogen was still falling into the white dwarf. And just for fun, we can try to simulate this using Universe Sandbox by having our planet fall into the white dwarf and suddenly they expand. It shouldn't really do that. It should still stay the same size. But anyway, let's try to create a slightly more realistic representation of all of this. And basically, so here you have the white dwarf with the accretion disk around it and a lot of the material falls into it, but a lot of it also dissipates um, throughout the system. And the only reasonable explanation that uh, the scientists were able to find is that there has to be a planet here. A planet very similar to Neptune and Uranus, with an orbit that took it around the White Dwarf every 10 days or so. And this planet was essentially being slowly destroyed by the White Dwarf 
and more specifically by the extreme radiation coming from the uh, center here. The temperature of this white dwarf is roughly around 28,000 degrees Celsius and because of this the um, Neptune here would very likely receive tremendously powerful amounts of UV radiation that would strip its atmosphere very slowly but very methodically and eventually it's probably going to come even closer to the actual center of the system and then turn into a ring itself. And interestingly, the planet itself is larger than the star in terms of size, but obviously not in terms of mass. But it is slowly shrinking and growing smaller and smaller every single year. And because all of this mass will eventually make it into the star itself, it's also probably very likely that we're going to see some major emissions at some point in the future. And until this discovery, we have never actually seen planets around white dwarfs. We didn't really think that most would survive. So this is the first ever proof that planets can and do survive these extremely hostile conditions. And one of the reasons it's important is because, like I mentioned before, this is technically the future of the solar system. Our solar system might one day look like this. And this could be one of the gas giants or ice giants that kind of do the same in our own solar system. So we're sort of looking into the future, the very distant future of the sun and all of the planets in our solar system. In some sense, finding more planets here would be really interesting and it seems that there might be another planet here simply because of where this object is located. There is currently no explanation for how it got so close to the star except for maybe through interaction with other planets. In other words, by having another planet in the system we could then explain how the orbit changed so much. Here, a planetary interaction would eventually cause the orbit of one of the planets to come close enough to the star and be in the location where it is today. So, in other words, by discovering a planet so close to the white dwarf, we kind of found proof that there might be other planets here. And by the way, in terms of distances from the star, this right here is roughly around 10 million kilometers or 1 15th of a distance of Earth to the Sun. So it is uh, not that far, but also not that close either. And so as you can see here in this uh, simple simulation, one of my planets did end up having a slightly closer orbit. And through um, years and years of interacting, they will eventually change their orbits completely. And discovering systems like this is kind of important for us because we do want to understand what's going to eventually happen to the sun. Is our sun going to be able to, for example, uh, support planets and potentially support um, other types of life that might evolve in the future in the next few billion years? Or is our sun going to be completely inhospitable to life because it's just going to have too much UV radiation? And so by looking at objects like this and by trying to discover more of similar systems, we'll one day be able to answer the question of how habitable our system will be. And although this particular event that's going to happen in a few billion years doesn't immediately affect us, it's not something we should be worrying anytime soon, it is nevertheless interesting to know this in case we are one of those species that do survive for those billions of years. I mean, you never know, right? So this is something we need to understand. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to be talking about a very interesting study that discovers several things. And one of them is that, turns out, the terrestrial planets are pretty common out there in the galaxy. While at the same time allowing us to study the actual rocks and the compositions of those unusual planets by using a very original technique. So the goal of modern astronomy and of course various um, exploration missions using various telescopes is for us to discover something very similar to planet Earth that we can maybe one day call home, or basically Earth 2.0. Today the majority of various scientific missions focus on trying to see these exoplanets and by trying to look at them and by trying to see them, we're hoping to discover what's happening on their surface. But we were actually never really been able to study their rocks and specifically their geological composition and of course their structure. This is something that we can't really do because since these planets are so far away, um, the only thing we can really do is maybe just kind of take a look at their atmosphere, specifically when they pass right in front of their star and you can kind of see right there, right at this moment, the light passes through the atmosphere so we can technically analyze it. But we can't really analyze rocks this way and we can't really find out what's inside of these planets. But there is one technique that was recently discovered by uh, scientists from the UCLA 
whose study was recently published in the Science magazine. Now, here's the thing though. Their study doesn't really focus on planets that exist. In other words, it's not really studying planets that are currently available for us to land on. Their study focuses on planets that have turned shredded by the uh, tidal effects from the star that used to exist in the center, specifically from the future version of what our sun is going to become, the so-called white dwarf. Okay, so let's try to kind of analyze this in a little bit more detail so it's more clear. So, first of all, this is what they were literally studying. They were studying the so-called rocks, the leftovers of various planets that existed around these stars, that eventually made their way toward the center of the star system, and then fell into the star in the middle, where they were able to finally see the elements that were kind of falling into the star. So, in other words, they weren't really looking at the planets themselves, they were still looking at the star, but they were also looking at the material that was slowly falling into the star. And that material turned out to be very similar to the material we have here on Earth. So, in a nutshell, they were literally kind of analyzing the potential future of our own solar system and what may one day become of other planets, like for example Earth and Mars. And this is something that we might uh, expect to happen in a few billion years from now. And um, the star that they were looking at, or the stars they were looking at, were very similar to what our sun is going to become. So specifically, the so-called white dwarfs. Here's the best example, this is Sirius B, the closest white dwarf to our um, solar system. Now, our sun is expected to become one of these white dwarfs in approximately 5 to maybe 7 billion years from now. And... Um, because of this, we thus expect very similar things to happen in our solar system as well. So the planets will get shredded, they'll turn into essentially rings that will orbit the white dwarf for some time, and eventually those rings will make it to the center, and um, as you can see here, the white dwarf will then absorb everything. Although technically I should remove the star here, because it shouldn't really be in the picture. And um, everything, um, as it gets absorbed, will technically be visible from a distance, uh, because we can analyze various chemical elements here as they fall into the white dwarf, and then obviously see what happens in the star system. And so by looking at various distant white dwarfs, the scientists behind this paper discovered that um, very similar composition was present in those star systems as well. And in this picture here, you can kind of see that the bulk Earth composition is not that far off from some of the other white dwarfs that they've investigated. Which of course suggests that those white dwarfs once upon a time most likely had planets very similar to Earth that eventually fell apart and are now being absorbed by the white dwarf in the middle. And generally speaking, white dwarfs, like the one you see here, this is once again Sirius B, but in Space Engine, this is a much more realistic representation of it, do have a tendency to um, collect these dust rings around themselves. There was a video I made previously where I explained a little bit more about how in various white dwarf systems we've detected really large ring formations that were most likely made out of these destroyed planets that existed a long, long time ago. So, all of this of course happens for one simple reason. White dwarfs in general, because they're so dense compared to a typical star, do have extremely strong tidal effects, and these tidal effects can break up objects pretty easily. Just to give you an example, here's a randomly generated planet um, that is going to very quickly dissipate and get destroyed by the white dwarf that's uh, right there. You can kind of see all of this already happening in real time, and after only a few minutes, this planet will very likely turn into essentially another ring of this white dwarf. And all of this will, of course, one day will make it sort of to the center of the white dwarf, although maybe not as fast as you just saw in this simulation. And because as these rocks fall into the white dwarf, they actually do produce a relatively easy to see chemical fingerprint, we can thus analyze it and find out what this system may have had in the beginning. Now, in their study, they only used six different white dwarfs, and uh, they were quite successful at discovering what exactly those rocks were made out of. And for the most part, um, it seems that there was a lot of other material present that we do expect from objects like a typical planet like Mars and Earth. And not just hydrogen and helium that normally is present um, in things like Jupiter and Saturn. At the same time, they discovered that a lot of the material, and specifically a lot of the metal that was um, absorbed by these white dwarfs, was actually oxidized. In other words, it was kind of like the rusted metal we have here on Earth, and the same type of material that's present in the Martian soil that gives it that orangey color. 
In other words, it was the same types of materials that make up our planet and Mars that seem to have been falling into those white dwarfs as well. And to the scientists behind this paper, this really just meant one thing. If these rocks that fell into those white dwarfs had very similar oxidation content as here on Earth, this suggests to us that maybe those planets had very similar events and very similar structure and composition to um, Mars and Earth. They might have had things like plate tectonics, they might even have had uh, magnetic fields, and um, all of this of course suggests that they could have maybe, just maybe, have life. Life that doesn't really exist anymore of course, because those planets have been destroyed and are long gone. But I guess the best part of the study is that this is really the first time ever we were able to quite thoroughly analyze the actual rocks coming from another exoplanet, even though this exoplanet no longer exists. There's very little um, other interpretation to the results behind the study. I mean, there's nowhere else those rocks could have come from. Although maybe it was a very large asteroid, but chances are it was really a planet, not so much an asteroid. But don't forget that the biggest discovery here is that exoplanets like Earth do seem to exist and may even have very similar composition to what we have here on our planet. And because the stars that those planets existed around were very very similar to our Sun, they were very likely either G-type or F-type or maybe K-type stars, in other words stars that are very very Sun-like, all of this suggests that Earth 2.0 might be out there and we'll definitely find it one day. In other words, the study definitely brings some good news to the search for exoplanets that might one day host humanity. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to be talking about how strange, weird and unusual our solar system is after all. We're actually going to be discussing this relatively new study that um, tries to figure out why is it that there's a certain type of a planet that's missing yet again from our solar system, but seems to be present in many other star systems out there. So there is actually another gap that we can find in planetary masses and planetary types right here. It seems that um, in between Saturn and Jupiter and also uh, Uranus and Neptune, there is something missing. And that something is referred to as sub-Saturn. This is actually from a paper that you can find in the description below. But the idea here is that um, we know that Saturn is about 95, I believe, masses of Earth. Whereas Uranus and Neptune are not even 20 masses of Earth. As a matter of fact, uh, Uranus is only approximately 15 masses of Earth. And so there is definitely something missing here. Where is a planet in between? And for the longest time, the way that this was explained is through, uh, well, essentially planetary creation. Uh, let me just try to show you what I mean by this. By creating a very rudimentary uh, solar system when it was essentially just being born. So right here you may actually see that there's a ring of particles, very massive particles as a matter of fact. A lot of these are essentially just um, ices and things like hydrogen and helium. And this is basically the early solar system. There's our sun. Now uh, the core accretion model, as it's known, uh, stipulates that basically, uh, once upon a time, only a few uh, thousands or millions of years after the initial creation of the solar system, some of the objects created the so-called core. And this was usually an Earth-like object, so we can actually go ahead and go in here, maybe take Mercury or something, and uh, place it in orbit here. And this core, um, as it started to accumulate material, grew larger and larger in size. Now we're going to see if this happens actually here. Uh, we might need to give it a little bit more mass actually, because according to the core accretion theory, the mass has to be somewhere around 10 masses of Earth. And so at this point, this is when it's actually going to start accumulating all of this gas. And the gas is going to start, as you can see, colliding with it. And with, within only um, a million years or so, it will actually vacuum up all of the gas in the vicinity. And this is how we believe Jupiter and Saturn uh, were actually born. And this is why they're so massive. So as you can see, they start vacuuming up all of the material. Now, unlike Jupiter and Saturn, uh, Neptune and Uranus didn't really have this massive core. They didn't really get a, ma a massive enough core to start vacuuming up um, materials in their outskirts. And so they never got to grow to large sizes. And for this reason, they were kind of stuck at being only about 
under 20 masses of Earth, whereas Jupiter became over 300 masses of Earth. And so um, that's essentially the core accretion model um, in a nutshell. But there is a problem with that model, and the problem is that we now start discovering more and more of these unusual sub-Saturn um, planets. As a matter of fact, we've discovered about 30 planets, including this one that you see on the screen right here, whose mass fits right between uh, Uranus and Saturn. In other words, they seem to uh, kind of discredit this um, accretion model. They seem to actually contradict what we believed for many years. This is one of such planets. We've actually recently recalculated its mass and redefined its creation as well. And it's basically this type of a planet known as Sub-Saturn. It's known as OGLE 2012 BLG 950LB. It was discovered back in 2012, but it was um, recalculated very recently to be approximately 39 masses of Earth, right between um, Saturn and Uranus and Neptune. So there's actually quite a lot of them we found. You can see many of them right here. And as you can see, there is actually quite a lot more planets that are being discovered nowadays because we actually found a much better technique of discovering them. Uh, using gravitational lensing, we can now discover a lot more of these objects that we thought didn't exist. And for this reason, we now think that the so-called core accretion model and specifically the so-called runaway gas accretion, which you see right here, slowly happening as my Mercury is getting more and more mass um, acquired from the outskirts, um, might actually be incorrect. In other words, maybe just maybe we were wrong about this whole uh, planet's vacuuming up gas because of the massive enough core. We think that um, this is maybe not how the planets were born, because even though we thought that sub-Saturns didn't really exist out there, we've found quite enough of them to basically be wrong about this assumption. Now, if the uh, core accretion model is wrong, and specifically if the runaway gas accretion model is wrong, in other words, if these planets didn't accumulate gas because of a large enough core, um, we might also be wrong about something related to Earth. Specifically, the runaway gas accretion model, this model right here, also explains how water came to Earth. In other words, um, the habitability of Earth is sort of based on this model. But if the model is incorrect, then we were incorrect in assuming how Earth became habitable and how it got its water. In other words, all of this water may have not actually came to Earth how we believed it came to Earth for the longest time. And so this new paper actually kind of tells us that maybe we need to reassess our planetary creation models and we also need to reassess them for one really important reason. Because um, by studying how our planet acquired water, we might be able to understand how planets become habitable and thus apply the, this new model to other exoplanets. We might be able to actually find a lot more habitable planets out there if we actually get a good enough model that explains how this thing right here, this blue bowl, became blue, how it acquired all of this water. Now, uh, for the most part, the core accretion model might still be kind of accurate, but the runaway gas accretion uh, might need to be kind of recalculated, reassessed, and um, re-explained. Because we have now discovered so many sub-Saturn planets, and because of our ability to actually detect a lot more in the future using the new gravitational lensing techniques, uh, we now believe that there is definitely a lot more planets out there that we didn't think existed. But a very interesting part of this observation is that this really shows us how super weird our solar system is. We seem to be lacking quite a lot of planets. We seem to be actually um, having planets or positions of planets that doesn't really exist in many other uh, star systems. And for the most part, what seems to be quite common in other star systems seems to be really weird in ours. So um, yeah, this study once again shows how super weird the solar system really is. Our planet Earth, after all, might be actually quite unique and quite unusual, and uh, our terrestrial planets too. And this suggests that 
our planet Earth and also all the terrestrial planets in our solar system might be super unique and very, very unusual compared to other solar systems. So maybe not really good news for people hoping to one day find habitable Earth-like planets, but at the same time, once we understand how these sub-Saturns are formed and most importantly, how we actually uh, acquired water on our own planet, we might be able to use these new uh, theories to try to find something else out there that we could potentially call Earth 2.0. For now though, maybe that's not the best news out there, but nevertheless, very interesting finding and yet again, an unusual type of a planet that doesn't seem to exist in our own solar system. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to be talking about a very very recent discovery coming from our neighborhood, specifically the star known as Proxima Centauri. And it looks like we've discovered, or potentially discovered, yet another planet there. So our neighbor might actually have two planets for us to one day explore. So Proxima Centauri is our closest uh, star to us, this is our neighbor, and we've discovered and confirmed a planet known as Proxima Centauri b that you see right here, um, that's at a distance of about 4.2 light years away from us. As you may already know, this uh, planet is actually really exciting for us because it's basically in the um, so-called habitable zone of its star, which is the star that you see in the back there. And it's also a relatively similar to Earth's uh, planet. It's about 1.27 masses of Earth. So for all we know, it could actually be the next Earth. But there are also a lot of speculations that maybe just maybe this planet is not very habitable simply because it's too close to its star and simply because it's actually probably tightly locked. The new planet that we think we discovered is farther away. As a matter of fact, if you were to look at the star system here from um, a distance, this is actually relatively close. The planet we discovered is way, way farther. Let me demonstrate how far away it is um, using Universe Sandbox. So if this right here is the system we're currently aware of, so this is Proxima Centauri and the Proxima B is right there. And actually you can even see the habitable zone here. Um, the planet we've now kind of discovered is somewhere on the outskirts, somewhere right here. Now this planet has not actually been confirmed yet, but the scientists from University of Turin in Italy are almost positive it's here. So now they're just looking for confirmations from um, either the same telescope or other telescopes that can actually confirm the existence of this planet. Now, what exactly have they discovered? Well, this planet is what's known as a super Earth. It's most likely um, at least six times the mass of Earth. Let me actually show you what Earth would look like here. At the same time, it's uh, most likely not as dense as Earth. So it could potentially be made out of rock and um, sort of like a mixture of different ices, very similar to objects like Ganymede and um, objects like Callisto, the moons of Jupiter. But that's an assumption based on the actual location of this planet. We don't really know or will know for a very long time what's on this planet. For now though, I simulated this to be an ice world because uh, this is our current assumption. At the same time, what we know about this is that it's, um, well, first of all, really far away from its parent star compared to the main planet. And the distance here is about one and a half astronomical units. So technically, it's actually the same distance from its parent star as Mars is. But because the actual star Proxima Centauri is much, 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 much smaller than our own sun, and because it's way, way, way less massive, this actually makes a huge difference. So basically where the second planet is located, things get really cold here. Now, don't forget Proxima Centauri is what's known as a red dwarf. So it's technically comparable in size to Jupiter. Basically, this is Jupiter right next to it. Uh, in comparison to our own sun, it's way smaller. This is what our own sun would look like next to it. And so because of this distance, uh, the most likely temperatures here are really cold. Uh, current assumption is that the average sort of temperature would be minus 234 degrees Celsius. So actually even colder than most planets in our own solar system. But because this planet is so far away from the star, it really raises the question, how were they even able to see it? How were they able to discover it? Well, um, this is actually where things get a little bit interesting for most scientists. First of all, um, because of the way that these planets are positioned, 
We can't unfortunately see these planets by direct means. Like for example, we can't really see it passing in front of the star like, like you just saw here because they're not really positioned in this way. Um, so the way we've discovered the first planet is actually by looking at how this planet was pulling and tugging on its star. Now here, um, this might not make sense at first until you realize that everything in um, the solar system, everything in the galaxy, everything in the universe, if it has mass, will have gravity. So here, um, it's not visible at first until you start looking at graphs and stuff. And then you'll realize that, uh, well, what this graph is showing you is actually the um, velocity or the speed of the star that's literally caused by the planet. Now, here, if I accelerate this, you'll see that um, eventually this will turn into a kind of a cyclical graph where the speed of the actual star um, goes up and down, goes up and down as the planet orbits around it. Now, this is basically because the planet itself is pulling on the star. Not a lot, but enough for us to notice it. And here, the actual speed, um, if you look closely, changes by about 3 meters per second, um, or approximately like 9 or 10 kilometers per hour, um, making it move faster and slower, faster and slower. Now, this can actually be detected by um, a telescope that's sensitive enough. And we do have such telescope. The most sensitive such telescope is actually in Chile. And you see it right here. This is the uh, La Silla Observatory. And it has this instrument right here called HARPS, which stands for High Accuracy Radial Velocity Planet Searcher. HARPS is actually um, the most accurate planet searcher or planet detecting telescope um, on the planet, not including the ones that are orbiting um, in outer space. So we do have telescopes like Kepler, for example, that discovered a lot of planets. And so here's actually a basic breakdown. We've detected a lot of planets by looking at them passing in front of the star. This is how Kepler worked. But uh, not all planets obviously can be detected this way because sometimes they don't pass in front of the star. And so we have other means, and one of those means is called radial velocity. And actually, HARPS is the most efficient at discovering these types of planets, and it's discovered approximately 130 of them so far. And there's also, of course, um, eight other methods, including microlending and imaging, but we're not going to be talking about these just now. So this radial velocity method is um, extremely efficient. Uh, usually, we can see planets tugging at stars um, at a speed of about 97 centimeters per second or about three and a half kilometers per hour. So it's very, very, very sensitive. Now, if we actually look at our own um, solar system, for example, let's go to our own solar system, you can actually realize that even here, um, the velocity of the star changes quite dramatically. And here it's actually already at 22 meters per second. And that's because Jupiter is pulling in our star so much that it's creating what's known as a barycenter um, where both objects sort of orbit around. So the actual barycenter, if we were to try to find it, is somewhere on the edge of the sun here. And you can even see the sun itself moving around this barycenter because basically Jupiter is massive enough to create this. Now, because of Jupiter, it's a little bit difficult to detect other planets um, in our own solar system for, let's say, an alien species. So in that sense, we're kind of safe. Uh, it's almost impossible to see Earth um, because of Jupiter. Jupiter is really, really hiding all of the other planets due to its pull on our own sun. Uh, but at the same time, um, this is essentially how you would be able to detect Jupiter from a really far away distance by looking at our sun directly and realizing that it's moving around some invisible point. And the only kind of a explanation to this is that right there somewhere, there it is, uh, is going to be an object pulling at it, which is Jupiter. And um, that's literally how HARPS works. This is how this particular telescope discovers these objects um, in other star systems and has discovered 130. And it's been very, very accurate, very precise. And so we think, or actually we almost certainly believe, that in this particular system known as Proxima Centauri, uh, we've just discovered in another planet. Now, it still has to be confirmed, and it's actually going to be confirmed either by um, HARPS telescope or actually even the Gaia telescope that's very, very accurate at detecting the velocities of nearby stars as well. And once it's confirmed, uh, we're probably going to start trying to find it because um, unlike this particular planet, the planet that's most likely going to be known as Proxima C um, is going to be visible for us to look at using actual telescopes. So 
it does have a very high chance of being seen by an imaging telescope and then we could even see its surface or study its atmosphere so there's a lot of excitement that's coming um, out of this particular discovery and this could potentially be the first planet that we look at directly uh, because it's large enough and because it's close enough this is the closest larger planet um, exoplanet specifically to planet earth well, anyway, on that note, um, so maybe, just maybe, this is what this planet looks like. This is a little bit of atmosphere. Although, we're still obviously not sure. It could be completely different. But this is very exciting, and hopefully by the end of next year, we might have a direct picture, a first picture, of another exoplanet. And that's, of course, just as exciting as the first picture of the black hole that just came out. Hello, wonderful person. This is Anton, and in this video, we're going to be talking about what's known as planets a new unusual hypothetical planetary object that the scientists believe may exist somewhere out there in the universe. Okay, first of all, Plunets? What is a Plunet? Now, it is a kind of a cute name, but when you think about it, it does sort of make sense. Plunets refer to objects that became planets after being a moon of another object. So basically, planet, moon, Plunet. The actual concept is still hypothetical, but it's based on very thorough simulations and also observations from various star systems where we've detected some unusual spectrometric um, parameters that didn't really make sense. So in other words, we believe that they do kind of exist somewhere, but we just haven't really found them yet. However, this particular paper that was released in June of 2019 goes on a very thorough analysis and also, well, in some sense speculation, but more of an explanation on what we should be looking for or looking at when looking for these planets. The uh, paper is based on various simulations, a very thorough analysis, and very specific explanations for why these scientists believe that somewhere out there, there are a bunch of planets orbiting around stars. So first of all, let's try to briefly simulate what they uh, try to do in the study. For the most part, they believe that the majority of these planets would be forming around objects known as hot Jupiters. These are very, very massive planets, usually more massive than Jupiter itself, and are relatively close to the parent star. There's a lot of them we've discovered in the galaxy, but we just don't have any in our own solar system, so we can't really test this theory. And here, um, if this object has a moon, or even several moons like the one I just found in Space Engine, then um, assuming that it's close enough to the parent star, it might reach a point close enough to the star where both the star and the planet will start playing a kind of a game of tag uh, with each other and try to dislodge the moon that the planet has. In other words, the orbital parameters of this particular moon are going to change dramatically and it's going to end up leaving the planetary system. Just to give you a visual example, here is the moon Io. It's in orbit around this relatively massive hot Jupiter that I placed. And because it's so close to the Sun, at some point uh, the Sun is going to start pulling at it so much that it's going to escape and become its own object. Now, it might take a while for this to happen and will usually depend on how much stress the object receives to begin with, but there are several conclusions to um, what happens when it becomes a planet. The most common resolution is most likely going to be this. It's going to possibly escape and become its own object. So now you can see that it's basically a planet around the new sun with a very eccentric orbit. So this is kind of what a planet would be like. The scientists in this paper provided very specific light signatures that we should be looking for uh, if looking for these objects known as planets. So as you can see, this is one potential resolution to this scenario. And the other resolution is that some planets might end up um, unfortunately, falling back into the planet and getting swallowed by it. This is also um, another potential resolution here, mostly because the planet is still much closer to the uh, planet than the star is, so it's very likely that some of them, or maybe even many of them, will probably just get swallowed back. And the last resolution here is obviously that some of these planets uh, that get kicked out from the planetary system might end up on the intersection course with the star itself and essentially get swallowed by the star instead of the planet. So here this is what's going to happen. It's going to slowly fall apart and then eventually fall into the star. But I guess the interesting part here is that, so how would we ever detect these objects? Well, the scientists behind this paper believe that as these planets go through this transition, 
they will most likely, uh, due to the uh, tidal pressures from the star, lose most of their atmosphere and a lot of their mass and this will create a very specific, very unique light signature that we're going to be able to detect. And that's of course because this transition is so stressful for this tiny planet that um, it will most likely completely change its parameters, removing any atmosphere that it had but also removing a lot of its mass. So it might have very unusual light signatures that uh, would probably not make sense otherwise and these light signatures from these unusual formations would be very distinct and very unique so that there's probably no other explanation other than a planet being formed. And what's even more interesting is that uh, following the simulations, the scientists were able to determine that some of these planets can stay in these orbits, relatively stable orbits, for potentially millions and millions of years. Some of them were hundreds of millions of years. And um, even though a lot of them would probably not be able to last that long, there's going to be at least a few of them that do survive. Especially the ones like this one right here that were able to uh, establish a very eccentric orbit and not really come close to the star or the planet and move to a relatively far and stable, safe location far away from the uh, hot Jupiter and from the star. The simulations also suggested that some planets might even be able to capture some of the gas from the star itself and accumulate enough uh, material to potentially reform their atmosphere and create some sort of a gas-like mass to once again become a planet-like object. In other words, these planets could reform into actual planets. Now for this accretion to occur, obviously there has to be a lot of gas um, orbiting around the star and the planet needs to be able to somehow capture it, but all of this could happen somewhere out there in the galaxy. However, the simulations also show that the vast majority of these objects, unfortunately, don't really live that long. Within about a million years, most of them disappear completely, one way or another. And what's interesting is that some of these objects even got ejected completely from the star system, becoming so-called rogue planets. So, it is kind of possible that some hot Jupiters, or maybe even a lot of hot Jupiters, used to have moons, possibly even a lot of different moons, and it's very likely that as they approach the star, many of these moons got ejected into the rest of the galaxy and are now their own little objects moving through interstellar medium completely alone, completely by themselves. Now it's very likely we'll probably never really see these objects because it's also possible that they're super super dark, very small and very difficult to observe. But just the fact that they could exist out there does make it kind of interesting. And considering the fact that objects like Jupiter, for example, have a lot of moons to begin with, it's also possible that hot Jupiters have a lot of moons. And if they do, some of these moons do probably escape, and some of them probably turn into these unusual objects known as uh, planets. So once we find a way to look for these objects, we'll probably be able to find at least one of them. But for now, I think it's more important to at least find an actual exomoon of an actual planet. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to be talking about a new discovery of 18 Earth-like planets from the old data from the Kepler-2 telescope. Today we're going to discuss how these planets were discovered and also what exactly makes them so special. Now all this actually comes from the two papers you can find in the description below. And the first paper talks about a discovery of a fourth planet in the system where we already knew about three other planets. And here um, it also talks about the specific resonance or pattern with which these planets orbit. And the second paper talks more about the 17 other terrestrial or Earth-like planets that were discovered um, through this very thorough analysis. Now before I explain to you what kind of planets they were, although technically we don't really know much to be honest, let's just briefly talk about what they actually did to discover this. So for this particular analysis, the scientists use the data that's already available publicly from the Kepler-2 mission, uh, that's the second part of the Kepler mission, um, where they investigated the 517 stars that Kepler-2 telescope was looking at. And previous um, analysis used this model, this is called BLS, which is also known as the box uh, least square model. In other words, uh, the way that we used to find planets is by um, having an actual program that looks for these dips, but it looked at them uh, in a very square fashion. But the new algorithm that was used for this particular discovery is based on this freely available Python program known as transit least squares. 
Now, I'm a huge Python fan. As a matter of fact, I used to teach Python professionally for many, many years. And um, I've used it myself a few times. It's very, very, very brilliant if you like math and if you like programming. But for this particular video, all you need to know is that the way that it searches for data now is a little bit more smooth. And so in other words, it's able to find transits of planets with a lot more accuracy than before. And using this algorithm, they were able to discover these 18 uh, planets. But what's really interesting about this particular discovery is that all of these planets were smaller planets, very similar in size to Earth, or slightly bigger, up to about 2.2 uh, radii, or actually even smaller. As a matter of fact, this particular mission discovered one of the smallest exoplanets we've ever found, the second smallest. Now, this right here is the smallest exoplanet that we've ever um, found. This one is um, in the Kepler-37 system, and it's known as Kepler-37b. It's just a little bit big bigger than the moon. Our moon is very comparable in size and potentially actually composition to this object. But the planet that they discovered is about 70% the radius of Earth, making it roughly somewhere in between the moon and the Earth in size. Uh, now, we don't really know what it looks like, we also don't really know what it's composed of, but we can only guess that it's very likely a terrestrial object, similar to Mars and potentially planets like Earth and Venus. And I think this picture right here sort of gives you a very good um, descriptive image of what they were able to find. So, this is Earth, this is Neptune, this right here is the second smallest planet they've discovered, and the rest are very similar to Earth. But this planet right here, with a relatively difficult name, is also very special because it's in a habitable zone of its parent star. In other words, it has a potential to have liquid water and, for all we know, atmosphere and maybe even habitable conditions. Maybe life? We don't really know. Now, this object is roughly around 1.87 uh, times larger than our planet, and it's potentially also what's known as a super-Earth, so it could be uh, a water world, it also could be an object that's filled with a lot of gases, and a very thick atmosphere as well. Um, so we don't really know what exactly is happening here, but we know that it's in a habitable zone of its parent star, and um, it might have an actual liquid ocean on the surface, because that's how we define habitable zones. And specifically, this algorithm that was used is extremely interesting, because it allows us to very accurately discover um, very similar to Earth planets, with extreme precision. And so the next step for these scientists is to look again at the data from Kepler-1 mission that looked at a lot of different stars and to apply this algorithm and try to discover more planets. Their assumption that they'll find at least a hundred more terrestrial worlds that we missed the first time. And so maybe just maybe we'll find more potentially habitable and exciting new worlds similar to the object they refer to as EPIC 2012 38110.02. Now, this is at a distance of over 500 light years away from us, so it's not really that close, but we might find objects that are closer that have very similar planets. And so, this is one research team that I really want to follow just to see what they discover in the new data set. And also, hopefully, they will be able to apply this particular analysis to other data from other telescopes as well. And by the way, if you're wondering about these other terrestrial planets, most of them, or actually almost all of them, are way too close to their parent stars and have really, really high scorching temperatures up to about 1000 degrees Celsius. So except for this um, very interesting planet, none of the other ones might really present any scientific interest until later on. Nevertheless, though, I'm definitely excited to see what this team discovers in Kepler-1 data and what they uh, go on to make later on as well. Until they find something else, that's it. Thank you for watching. Hopefully you'll learn a little bit more about space and sciences from this mission. Let's end this mission just like we used to back in the days by colliding things and, well, I guess, destroying Earth. And this time we're going to destroy it with two newly discovered terrestrial planets. Goodbye, Earth. You're now going to be part of this bigger object that um, has a very strange name, actually. Hello, wonderful person. This is Anton, and welcome to the system known as GJ357, also known as Gliese 357. This is a system that we recently discovered to have three different exoplanets, and some of them are kind of exciting. Now, while we're exploring the system, we're also going to try to recreate this using uh, universe sandbox just so we can actually see the size of, of things and how planets are going to react to the star that we have right here, because universe sandbox is pretty good at representing the physics. Now, this star itself is what's known as a red dwarf, and for the most part, normally we don't expect these stars to be 
really good sort of pairings. They're very active, they're usually not very hot, and the planets we've discovered around them, like for example the ones in the Trappist-1 system, um, are for the most part what's known as tidally locked. In other words, they're always facing with the same side toward the star, suggesting that one side is going to be very hot and the other side is going to be very cold. We also usually refer to them as the eyeball planets. Now we expect something similar to happen here as well, except for one of the planets that's actually farther away, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. So what exactly have we found here? Well, first of all, this star is not as active as other red dwarfs and seems to spin a lot slower as well, so it does already have a potential to host possibly habitable planets, maybe? We don't know yet. And although we've discovered uh, roughly around 200 different exoplanets around other red dwarfs, um, only a few of them were kind of exciting. Obviously the closest one to us, Proxima Centauri, is kind of exciting because it's so close to us. We also have an object known as Gliza 1132b, which is right here, this was discovered back in uh, 2015. Then we have LHS 1140C, which is right here, and as you can see it's a little bit on the hot side. And lastly, there's another really interesting exoplanet, K2 18b. Now, the reason all three are interesting is because they're somewhat similar to Earth in size, they're in an interesting location around their star, and for the most part they're different from the other planets we've discovered that are probably tidally locked and are definitely not habitable. However, now we've discovered another such planet, and it's in this system we're talking about today. And the system was discovered by the test telescope that in a sense replaced the super famous by now Kepler telescope. So pretty much most of the new exoplanets will be discovered by TESS in the next few years. The system itself, in a nutshell, kind of looks like this. Basically you have the star, and there are three planets, two are kind of close to the actual star, one is a little bit farther away, this right here is the habitable zone. And the way that these planets were discovered is, interestingly, by first finding this one, this one actually did pass in front of the star, and dim it just enough for TESS to see it, but this had to be confirmed. And to confirm this, the scientists behind this particular paper had to analyze it using some different method. And for this second method, they use what's known as radio velocity measurement, which basically does the following. Let me try to help you visualize this by placing the Sun and Jupiter a little bit farther away from the Sun. And you'll see that as soon as I set these objects to orbit around one another, the uh, gravitational pull from Jupiter is actually going to um, give our Sun an actual visible motion that you'll see uh, represented with this little line here, that's the uh, trail that Sun is leaving. Although it's probably much better seen if we look at the actual graph of the velocity of our Sun. So here you see that because of the Jupiter's pull on the planet, the velocity of the Sun changes. So it goes faster, slower, faster, slower. Now when you have several planets, which we'll do right now by placing another massive planet like Saturn uh, somewhere in orbit, you'll see that the velocity starts changing a little bit differently. Now do so another time, let's just say with a Neptune somewhere in between them, and now you have a pattern that's even more, um, I guess in a sense different, but at the same time still somewhat repetitive. And this is how the scientists were able to discover that there are actually three different exoplanets around the star. Instead of just seeing one pattern, they saw something like this. And What's more is that one of these planets is really massive and somewhat far away, the other one is a little bit closer, and the third one that they were trying to confirm is really really close to the star itself. So that's kind of how they've discovered these three planets. And let's also recreate this particular system just so you can visualize it as well. So this is the star, um, it's roughly around 34% the mass of our sun, so this is basically a red dwarf. In terms of the size, it's actually closer to Jupiter than it is to our Sun. It's um, bigger than Jupiter, but not by much. Then we have these three planets, and the first one, the one that we were able to discover by looking at it, known as GJ357b, the planet is um, relatively similar to Earth, but also a lot more massive than Earth. It's about 1.8 masses of Earth. It's also bigger in radius, so here is what it looks like compared to Earth. Um, and at the same time, it's way closer. A single orbit here will take this planet uh, roughly around 3.9 days. 
so it is probably pretty toasty pretty hot close to about 250 to maybe even 500 degrees celsius depending on what the atmosphere is like it's currently changing quite dramatically you'll see that it's going to have nothing left on the surface in a few minutes when we come back to it the second planet in the middle is obviously known as gj 357 c this is also a very toasty world but this one is also more massive its mass um is and also obviously its size about 3.4 times the mass of Earth, also its size is bigger. And overall, uh, both of these are already known as super-Earths. These are not really Earth-like objects. The last one is even more massive and um, borders on what's known as a sub-Neptune. Basically, this is an object that's um, so massive and so large that uh, it probably classifies more as a smaller gas giant than it does as a regular planet. So this is probably super-Earth, but maybe also sub-Neptune, which is actually a very rare type of a planet that we haven't really discovered um, very much in our galaxy. Now, this object is about 6.1 times the mass of Earth, and obviously much larger in size than Earth. But what's interesting about this particular object is that it receives uh, just as much radiation in this particular part of the star system as the beautiful planet known as Mars. And so because of this, since it receives just as much radiation, because it's larger in size and because it potentially has atmosphere, there's a very high chance that this object might potentially host a very large, very liquid ocean, depending, of course, on the conditions on the surface. And also because it's so far away from the star, it's probably not tidally locked. There's a very high chance it's a free-spinning planet, suggesting that it might have um, seasons, it might have different climate, very similar to climate here on Earth. But all of these are still speculations because we just have discovered this. We haven't even taken a look at the planet, we only know of its existence from the radial velocity. So once we are able to look at it from, for example, things like test telescope, um, we might be able to actually find out what's going on here. But right now, um, because this star is only about 31 light years away from us, this particular planet might become one of the more interesting Earth-like, or I guess in this case, super Earth-like um, habitable candidates that we'll need to investigate later on. And while the planet D is definitely an exciting prospect for us to discover and to look at, the um, other interesting planet is right here. This, of course, being the hottest or one of the hottest super-Earths we've discovered. As a matter of fact, you can almost say that this is the so-called missing hot Earth, the planet that we haven't really seen very often or pretty much anywhere, but that seems to exist in this system where the planet, Earth-like planet, is so close to the star that it's very, very, very hot, potentially to the point of having an actual um, lava lakes on the surface with a lot of a lot of really hot activity and a lot of really interesting emissions that we'll need to investigate later on. For now, we haven't really seen much because we've just discovered them only a few weeks ago from when I'm making this video. So this is definitely an exciting system. We have this hottest planet with really interesting atmosphere that we'll need to observe and we have what might be a habitable water world that also has a somewhat high chance of being one of the first habitable water worlds we've discovered not so far away from our own planet. At least in uh, cosmic terms, it's still pretty damn far away. 31 light years means that the light takes 31 years to get there. Yeah, we will probably not be getting there anytime soon, but hopefully we'll at least get to look at it sometime in the next few years. Now, interestingly, all three of these exoplanets have already been added to the beautiful space engine, so if you have the simulation, you can actually explore them there as well. They're pretty interestingly represented. This is the closest one. This is the so-called warm mini-Neptune, uh, as it's called here. Here's the second planet. This uh, is 357C, also a temperate mini-Neptune. And lastly, we have the larger planet known as Cool Super Aquaria. This one is probably my favorite so far. So uh, these planets are already there. You can definitely check them out. But most importantly, from what we've discovered so far, um, there's really another important metric that is used or has been used in this paper that will allow future telescopes like James Webb to focus on these planets as well. This metric relates to how likely are these objects to retain permanent atmosphere. 
This metric relates to their mass and their density and also the star they orbit. But um, it just so happens that in this particular star system, uh, this planet, but also the even the closest planet, 357A, have the second most likely chance of all of the exoplanets we've discovered to actually have a very strong, very thick atmosphere. Which of course suggests that all three planets probably also have very um, unusually hot conditions because of the greenhouse effects, and this planet might be close to about 700 or even 800 degrees Celsius. But this also gives the planet 357D that, as you can see, is in the habitable zone, a much, much higher chance to be habitable. Depending on the thickness of the atmosphere, it might even be a little bit warmer than we want it to be. And although this metric is still being developed, it already means that this particular star system is going to be probably one of the first systems we'll be looking at when James Webb Telescope becomes active and starts looking at atmospheres of various exoplanets. And well, for now, that's really all we know about the system of three exoplanets known as GJ357. And once we discover more, we'll come back and talk a little bit more about this. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and in this video we're going to be talking about a discovery related to this planet that you see on the screen that might actually be not good news for planets orbiting around the so-called M-type stars. We'll talk about how this planet right here seems to have like absolutely no atmosphere whatsoever. So the object known as LHS 3844b, which is what you see right here on the screen and this is something that's available in Space Engine for you to explore, is a planet or exoplanet we discovered uh, only a few months ago by using the really famous now TESS telescope. Basically by looking at this planet pass in front of its star, we saw that, well, there was something happening and this something was of course an exoplanet. And although it was a very exciting discovery at first, we soon realized that this planet orbits its star surprisingly close. A single orbit here takes about 11 hours, meaning that the surface of this object is probably really toasty. But this star that it orbits is the most common type of a star in the uh, galaxy, known as M-type dwarf, also known as a red dwarf. These red dwarfs are normally only, um, in terms of size, about the same size as Jupiter, as you can see, but in terms of mass, obviously a lot more massive. And one of the more exciting discoveries related to M-type stars was this right here, TRAPPIST-1, the system we discovered only a couple of years ago where there are seven Earth-sized planets orbiting around the system, and some of them also seem to be in the so-called habitable zone where we could potentially have liquid water. But this paper from Nature magazine that was released only a few days ago from when I'm making this video talks about a study, a very thorough study of one of such planets around a similar M-type dwarf and discovers a complete absence of any atmosphere. Now this study is brilliant in many different ways, but I wanted to start with the how. How did they actually find out all of this? Well, it's actually pretty clever. So luckily for us, when this planet orbits its star, we can quite easily and quite quickly see the changes in brightness around the star. Basically the dips and um, sudden increases in brightness. This is how we were able to see it to begin with. But Laura Kreidberg, the main researcher behind this paper, also created this beautiful animation that shows you exactly what they were able to see. So here, as the planet orbits every 11 hours, you'll notice that um, at some point, as it comes in front of us, suddenly the brightness here dips. That's when it passes in front of a star. Then, when it's on the other side of the star system, the brightness once again dips. But what's happening here? Well, what we're actually observing are the reflections of the starlight coming from the planet. So you'll notice that the orange part here increases the brightness, and then suddenly this brightness disappears as the planet goes behind the star. And here the brightness starts decreasing, then dips one more time and starts increasing again. So they were able to see all of this with quite a lot of accuracy by looking at this planet for 100 hours and observing about 10 or so passages of the planet around the star. So by looking at all of these points, they realized that it was quite uh, possible to use these differences here to try to see what kind of an atmosphere this planet might have by looking at the differences in temperature between the dark side of the planet and the bright side of the planet. And let's use this object here, TRAPPIST-1c, as a kind of an example. 
So because these objects are all tightly locked, and this is true for pretty much all of the planets orbiting around M-type dwarfs, uh, one side will always be super hot, the other side will be super cold. But depending on the atmosphere, like for example if there's a thick atmosphere, some of this temperature might get exchanged because obviously the atmosphere will move around the planet as well and will regulate all of the uh, conditions making it more or less similar if the atmosphere is very thick or making it very different if the atmosphere is very thin. In our solar system we have two perfect examples of this. One is Venus that has a very slow rotation but despite one side always facing away from the sun for like basically months at a time, this side is still ridiculously hot. The entire surface of Venus is more or less the same in temperature because the atmosphere is thick enough to literally transfer heat across the entire planet. On the other hand, Mercury that basically has practically no atmosphere whatsoever here, one side, the one that's closest to the sun, will always be pretty toasty, pretty hot, whereas the dark side will be super cold, and this changes almost instantly because there's no atmosphere to maintain this heat and to transfer it across the planet. And so the darker side of Mercury is always significantly much colder than the bright side. As a matter of fact, um, some parts of Mercury never get any sunlight, specifically some of the craters in the um, polar regions. And so we've actually discovered uh, ice in a lot of these craters, even though sometimes on the bright side the temperatures are in hundreds of degrees. But since there's no atmosphere to uh, transfer this heat, it kind of never melts, it stays super cold in those darker craters. And so what exactly did the scientists discover when looking at this object here? Well, turns out that when they looked at the hotter side, the temperature here was close to about a thousand degrees Kelvin. Pretty hot, it's basically around 720 degrees Celsius or about 1300 degrees Fahrenheit. But on the dark side, they realized the temperature was as close to absolute zero as it gets. In other words, it was ridiculously cold as if no heat transfer happened whatsoever. Which of course means two things. One is that this planet is definitely tightly locked and one side is always facing to toward the star. But the second thing is that it has like zero atmosphere. There's not even a remotely thin atmosphere similar to Mars. And because this object is somewhat similar in size to Earth, it's about 30% larger than Earth, and in terms of mass, it's possibly a little bit more massive. Here it says it's about 1.7 masses of Earth. It's basically what's known as a super-Earth. And we're very excited to have these objects in a nearby galaxy, but um, around an M-type star, it's very likely that a lot of these objects will have no atmosphere whatsoever, which is actually kind of bad news. Now, we can't really uh, assume that this applies to all of the M-type stars, because first of all, this object is really, really close to its parent star. It's already very hot, and this is something we've predicted a long time ago. But at the same time, um, we still need to do more of these observations, and we need to look at other similar objects to discover if they also might not have any atmosphere. But because we now have this really brilliant technique that they use in this paper, it's going to be possible to analyze other similar objects as well. Now, as you can see in Space Engine, it does have an atmosphere, so it doesn't really look as it should look. The team behind Spitzer Telescope that was responsible for analyzing this planet released this image that gives you an idea of what this planet might really look like, as a kind of a scorched, darker object. And the reason it looks like this is because they also analyzed the composition on the surface which after they've analyzed, they realized that the planet probably looks a little bit more similar to a basaltic structure or basaltic surface, which is sort of like the color of um, volcanic rock. A lot less reflective and absorbing a lot of energy that comes from the star. So basically by being a lot less reflective, it's already hotter than it should be as well. In some sense, it actually does kind of resemble Mercury when you think about it, because Mercury is also very dark and very, very hot. And so I thought it would be a good idea to maybe try to change the planet right here in Space Engine to make it look a little bit more realistic. We can actually do this by using some of the features in Space Engine. You can press Shift F2, for example, to bring up these options where you can play around and change the planet almost entirely. And here we go. This looks a lot more realistic. No clouds, no atmosphere, tidally locked, super, super hot. Maybe not as dark as it should be in real life, 
but still pretty dark with very low reflectivity and also kind of mysterious and kind of beautiful. The temperatures on the surface on the bright side here will be roughly around 700 to 800 degrees Celsius, whereas the temperatures on the dark side or the night side will be about minus 270 degrees Celsius. The twilight side here is of course somewhere in between. Now in one of the future studies, uh, the scientists behind this paper are planning to investigate cooler objects. In other words, objects that are not as hot as this one. The only reason they chose this object is because it was a lot easier to study this since it passes the star so quickly and because it's so close to their parent star. Using this technique, they can now try to investigate other um, very similar tidally locked objects, hopefully even objects in the TRAPPIST-1 system, and then we'll know for a fact if these objects can maintain the atmosphere. And by the way, the reason why there is no atmosphere is because in the first billion years of existence of these M-type uh, stars, they're so bright in the ultraviolet light and they're so powerful, way more powerful than our sun, that they literally strip any kind of atmospheric molecules from the surface and very likely also destroy any chances of, of having actual water on the surface. This is our belief so far. We don't really know if um, we're correct or not because we haven't seen enough of these to, to actually make this a fact. But we think that it's very likely that many of these objects don't really have atmospheres. Basically, in the first few billion years of the existence around these objects, they get stripped entirely of any atmospheric pressure. And this is, of course, also really bad news for us because the closest exoplanet to us in the habitable zone of its parent star is also orbiting an M-type star. The Proxima Centauri system with the Proxima B planet uh, that you'll see in a few seconds just so happens is also very similar both in size and in some sense in location, although a lot farther away. So once we are able to study this object, we'll hopefully be able to understand what's actually here. We don't really know what this looks like, we don't even know if this is a terrestrial planet or possibly some sort of a small gas planet. We just know that it's in the habitable zone and that it's somewhat similar um, in size to Earth. But we also believe that it is also tidally locked to the parent star that you see right there. But as you can see here, it's a lot farther away. So uh, discovering whether these objects can maintain an atmosphere is really important. Because if they can't, we shouldn't even go here. There's no point trying to investigate this planet because it's not going to be hospitable to human life. Unless, of course, we decide to live on the dark side. Which for some people, I guess is okay. Hello, wonderful person. This is Anton. And in this video, we're going to be answering a mystery of the so-called hot Jupiters. Or actually, a lot of other gas giants that we've discovered in the last few years or so. Today we'll talk about why is it that so many star systems have these really unusual objects with really highly eccentric orbits. So first, let's uh, identify the problem. If we look at our own solar system, we'll discover four terrestrial or rocky planets in the middle, or actually a lot closer to the Sun. And as we move away from the Sun, we'll discover gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn. And then on the outskirts, we'll discover objects like Uranus and Neptune. These are so-called ice giants. And we, of course, believe that this is very typical of other star systems. Basically, we expected to find something similar, at least in terms of the location and the structure, pretty much everywhere out there in the universe. And it just so happens that what we found was pretty much the opposite. We have not actually found a single star system out there that would mimic our own. But what we have found are many star systems that have these unusual objects, known as hot Jupiters, or other similar gas giants very, very close to the parent star. In many of these systems, essentially we have these really large planets super, super close to the parent star, and in most cases, um, they're a lot closer than they should be. And also in many of these star systems, the actual planet, instead of having a somewhat circular orbit, would often have something a little bit more eccentric. Essentially orbits that are more oval and more um, stretched out and are not circular. Which would be very unusual for a planet that's really massive. Because in our own solar system, um, all of the gas giants have a relatively circular orbit. The planets with highest eccentricity are the ones with the smallest mass, like Mercury has the highest eccentricity of them all. 
and the objects um, with even higher eccentricity are usually um, asteroids or anything else located in the asteroid belt, like for example Vesta, Ceres and so on. So um, the mass has a very high correlation with eccentricity. The more mass you have, the less eccentricity you get. And it makes sense, because it's obviously a lot easier to move or to dislodge an object like Mercury than it is an object like Jupiter because Jupiter is several thousand times more massive than Mercury. And because of this, when we've discovered that there are a lot of gas giants that do have eccentric orbits, we were basically more confused and um, uncertain how to answer the question of how did they actually get there and how did they get such orbits. And since the original discovery of this planet right here, 51 Pegasi b, discovered in 1995, this is the first ever planet around a sun-like star, we found quite a lot more, a lot more various types of exoplanets and various types of gas giants with very close orbits to the star, eccentric orbits, and various masses, even more massive than Jupiter. Here's actually a simulation by Ian Webster that you can find in the description below that shows you a large number of exoplanets we discovered and plots all of them in the same region of the solar system. And this is of course just to give you an idea of where various exoplanets are and uh, how massive and how large they are. But here if you look really closely you'll see that there are some really large massive objects that do have an eccentric orbit. And these are the planets that scientists are really not sure how to explain just yet, or at least they weren't until the paper that just came out. The paper that you can also find in the description below that essentially uh, deals with this problem, trying to explain how massive large planets can have eccentric orbits very close to the parent star. Now for this study, the scientists can only do one thing, they can only simulate things. And so they basically ran a simulation where the initial number of planets was always set to 10, but the total mass of the star system was always changed. And many different simulations were run over and over and over again just to see what is created after a few millions of years of essentially evolution of a star system. And uh, what they discovered after running these simulations is that in a system where the initial mass was much higher than the mass um, of our own solar system or other star systems, in all of these uh, systems, for some unknown reason, eventually the actual uh, evolution resulted in very massive, very large planets close to the star with highly eccentric orbits. However, in systems where the mass was much lower than the initial mass of the solar system, or just in systems with relatively low mass to begin with, they evolved to have circular smaller planets and um, planets that didn't really have a lot of interaction. So in other words, if we were to take a look at two star systems that are about to be developed, with one having, let's just say, a total mass of about um, one mass of Jupiter, and the other system with like five or even six times more mass, those two systems will evolve very differently. The smaller system will be more stable, will not have as many collisions or possibly not even have as many large planets, whereas the more massive system will eventually develop these really large and really massive uh, Jupiter-like objects, or basically really large gas giants, with somewhat eccentric orbits. In other words, they'll have orbits that can technically also disrupt a lot of um, habitability in the system by kicking out other planets. But why is it that these massive giants with eccentric orbits develop in these unusual star systems and not the ones with less mass? Well, to answer this, uh, the authors of the paper took a look at what was actually happening in their simulations. And they realized that there was a lot of collisions, many different collisions happening between essentially gas giants. As these gas giants were being generated, as they were created, many of them collided with one another, and because of the total mass transfer, and of course because of the transfer of momentum, their orbits would change. They would come closer and closer to the parent star, and they would thus dislodge a lot of other planets, and possibly have them collide as well. Now, we've previously discovered uh, planets that do have eccentric Jupiter-like objects, and actually have smaller planets as well, but the chance of having a smaller planet in such a system is dramatically lower than in a system like around our own sun. In other words, it's more likely that these systems are 
devoid of any other smaller planets. Or at least the planets like Earth might be a lot more rare in these systems compared to places like our own Sun. And this also suggests that more mass leads to more collisions and more collisions lead to more destruction in the star system. And these giant impacts are also probably responsible for kicking out other planets, creating a lot of so-called rogue planets, or basically planets that have no star. And at the same time, because their orbits are eccentric and because their mass is really high, they will more often than not disrupt the entire system, creating a lot of instability in the process. Like, for example, if you take a look at the orbit of this Jupiter here after it collided with Saturn, its orbit is exceptionally eccentric now. And here, if we run the simulation a little bit faster, you'll notice how it's going to start kicking out all of this dust that I've created here just to show you what happens when these really massive objects start orbiting around a typical star. And here, only after a few years, um, you'll notice how a lot of stuff starts basically flying apart and it even generates these unusual formations in between the uh, material that used to orbit around the Sun. So, if I run this really, really quickly, you'll notice how the entire system is going to start being disrupted pretty quickly. And it's not going to stay stable for a very long time, being destroyed by the eccentric Jupiter that orbits here. So this is what we think might happen in these systems, but because we've detected so many of them, their origin was always a mystery. And this paper does a really good job at explaining how all of this has formed and how these systems might evolve over time. And because we've discovered so many different systems that have these eccentric Jupiters or Jupiter-like objects orbiting around the parent star, it's important to understand what happens in them. Uh, most importantly, of course, because we want to find any terrestrial objects in these systems. And it looks like, just based on what you're seeing here, the chance of planets surviving is not going to be really high. The other discoveries coming from this paper are that uh, most of these collisions happen at a relatively close distance, within about 8 or so astronomical units, so the fact that we actually have objects like Uranus and Neptune on the outskirts of the solar system of course reinforces the fact that they were moved here later on. They most likely were created closer to where Jupiter or Saturn are and eventually moved to the outskirts. Something similar probably happens around other star systems, but if the gas giants end up colliding, they will usually move closer to the star. And at the same time, this paper also gives a little bit more evidence to the creation of Planet 9. This mysterious planet uh, may have also existed in the solar system, and instead of colliding with other objects like Jupiter and Saturn, very likely ended up being kicked out to the outskirts and is somewhere out there right now. So it's definitely a pretty interesting paper and allows us to explore our ideas and theories in a little bit more detail by using computer simulations. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to be talking about yet another incredible discovery that was just announced a few hours ago from when I'm making this video. It seems that one of the closest known stars to us, Tea Garden Star, may actually have two Earth-like terrestrial exoplanets around it. Okay, before we start, um, I need to get this out of the way. This is still uh, an unconfirmed discovery by a single team, but their actual paper that you can find in the description below goes through a lot of detail to show that it's very likely an actual discovery of two terrestrial planets. And so even though it's an unconfirmed discovery, the method of detection was very precise, so it's very likely that those planets are real. Now, here we're looking at 100 nearest stars to us. You'll notice Alpha Centauri is right there. Uh, a few more stars you may know are also here, like for example the famous uh, Ross 128, the Captain star, and so on. But the one we're interested in is actually very difficult to see, even with a very, very large telescope. It's this right here, it's called Tea Garden Star, named after its discoverer and his team. And this particular star, if you were to look at it, would be extremely dim. This is what's known as an ultra-cool dwarf. Not because it's cool, but because it's actually really cold. At least for a star, because the temperature here is roughly around 2700 degrees Kelvin. This is about half of the temperature on the surface of the sun. And because of this, um, this star is very difficult to see um, in the night skies. We've discovered it completely by accident um, back in 2003, when we were actually looking for asteroids. And what we saw was this. You can kind of see the motion right there in the middle of the screen, this little speckle of light right here, 
that's the Tea Garden star. It's one of the fastest moving across the night skies, and um, because of this, it was detected by an asteroid survey that was supposed to discover asteroids, but by accident, we discovered this little star. It's extremely dim, it's very, very difficult to detect with um, pretty much any major telescope except for some really, really sensitive ones. And until 2009, we weren't even sure how close it was. And turns out it's roughly around 12 and a half light years away from planet Earth. And so this really dim, very, very small star um, that's roughly around 8% the mass of the Sun is something that was um, really interesting to this team of scientists from Germany whose paper you can find in the description. And they were essentially looking at it for approximately three years using the Color Auto Observatory and specifically um, a device known as Carmenes. The device that was installed roughly around three to four years ago to essentially help look for exoplanets, specifically by using a method known as the uh, radial velocity method. Now, um, the way this method works is actually kind of simple. And let me use our own solar system to demonstrate this. So here is the sun, and you'll notice that our sun is actually moving around in the middle. It's not really staying still. So something is actually causing it to move around a little bit. That something, for the most part, is Jupiter. Jupiter is causing our sun to have a kind of a orbital wobble that is detectable if you look at it long enough using a very sensitive telescope. So in other words, uh, a typical planet, as it orbits around the star, will actually cause that star to wobble. And this wobble um, can be detected using telescopes specifically designed for this by using the red shifting and the blue shifting of the light and uh, by looking at how periodic this happens. So this is roughly how they were able to discover these two planets. And their um, study is actually very detailed in explaining how accurate it was and also in explaining the periodicity of these detections. So in other words, they weren't really looking at the star directly and trying to see the shadow of the planet pass in front of it. Instead, they used the actual wobble of the star itself to try to detect the planets. And they looked at the star for roughly around three years and detected two very easily observable periodic um, objects that seemed planetary whose mass they were able to determine quite accurately. And the mass here um, was surprisingly very similar to the mass of planet Earth. Now, um, this is a procedurally generated Tea Garden star in space engine specifically. And here we have a few planets around it. All of them were procedurally generated. And some of them are actually very similar to planet Earth. Like, for example, this one. Uh, in terms of mass, at least, it's very close to planet Earth. As a matter of fact, there are two planets that actually fit the description from the paper. So even a procedurally generated simulation like Space Engine seems to suggest that uh, this particular star should have at least a couple of terrestrial or Earth-like planets. Now, let's try to recreate them using Universe Sandbox and look at their parameters, because that's really important. Um, you know, it's actually important to find out if those planets are actually interesting to us, in other words, if we could one day settle them, or if it's some kind of a hellish world where we would never be able to survive. So these two planets uh, don't have really any good names right now. They're just known as Tea Garden Star B and Tea Garden Star C. And for the most part, both of these stars seem to be located, at least to some extent, in the so-called habitable zone of the parent star. Tea Garden Star B is a little bit closer to the warmer side. In other words, um, it's not as far as Venus, but it's still close enough to have slightly warmer temperature, whereas Tea Garden C is roughly around the same distance as where Mars would be. And both of these planets um, seem to actually have relatively similar mass to Earth, actually a little bit more than Earth. One is about 25% uh, more massive and the other one is about 33% more massive than our own planet. So here is roughly what all of this looks like. We have two planets. One is a little bit closer. This is the planet known as B. And one is a little bit farther away, known as C. The closest planet takes um, just a little bit under five days to orbit the star, whereas the farther planet takes uh, roughly around 11 days. And one important thing to notice here just like with the other M-type stars, other red dwarfs, it's very likely that both of these planets are actually tidally locked. Now, um, that suggests that, well, maybe these two planets might be very different from Earth after all. But then again, we have examples like Venus, where the atmosphere can potentially cause the planet to have some kind of a rotation. Specifically, the retrograde rotation where a planet spins backwards. So we're not 100% sure that these are tidally locked, but they could be.
Now, um, one other thing to notice here is that uh, without any atmosphere, without any actual greenhouse gas effect here, um, the temperature on the closest planet is already pretty warm. It's roughly around 15 degrees Celsius here. And so it really depends on the size of the planet. If this planet for the most part is metallic, if it's very high in density, in other words, let's say it has a huge metal core and so its size is much smaller, it will actually receive much less radiation and thus become cooler and will thus have a higher chance of being terrestrial and Earth-like. At the same time, by having a large metallic core, it may also have very high magnetic field, protecting this planet from all sorts of radiation coming from the star itself. But at the same time, if this object is for the most part ices and water or even gases, uh, in other words, if it's some kind of a gigantic super Earth, in that case, it will definitely be much hotter. Specifically, it will probably be some kind of a boiling super Earth with a very large uh, liquid ocean or potentially very large uh, gas-like atmosphere. And so it's not going to be a very interesting habitable planet, but it's still going to be interesting to look at. So for this closest planet, the actual density means a lot, but we're not going to be able to see its density until we're able to take a look at the actual planet and determine its radius. Unfortunately for us, this planet doesn't really come in front of the star, so we are unable to see its true radius. We're going to have to determine it in some other ways. Nevertheless, though, um, considering the actual parameters we've discovered about this planet so far, and also considering the distance from the star and other um, factors, this object right here currently has one of the highest so-called Earth similarity indices. That's the value that we often use to try to find out if an object is similar to Earth in some way or if it's um, different in some important parameter, like for example distance from the star or the actual mass or radius. Now for this object, so far this is one of the highest. I'm going to talk about the highest we've discovered so far in another video, but um, this is really close to 100%. According to the scientists, I believe it's roughly around 94%. So that is um, so far one of the highest we've discovered. Now what about the other planet? Well, the other planet is a little bit farther away um, and because of this, it's more Mars-like and it's actually very close to Mars in its Earth similarity index as well. It's roughly around 80%. But once again, depending on the actual uh, composition, this could potentially be a water world as well, or even uh, some kind of a habitable world with enough temperature here to sustain um, viable conditions for human life. But for this object, it will all depend on the atmosphere as well, and of course on the greenhouse gases that might be present here. If it has a lot of greenhouse gases that could warm up the surface, it could definitely have something like this. It could be a very viable world, it could be a habitable world, and it could even be an inhabited world already. Which is really interesting because at the end of this paper, the scientists even speculated that if there is any kind of extraterrestrial life on these worlds, they will likely for them be able to even see our own planet Earth passing in front of our sun starting in 2044. In other words, if the Tigardians, as the authors of this paper refer to them, look at our sun, they'll be able to see our planet pass in front of the sun and thus analyze it and look at it in the same way that we look at planets and discover them using telescopes like, for example, Kepler. And I thought it was very interesting for them to end the paper with that because there's definitely a lot of hope that we'll, one day we'll discover some kind of an alien life somewhere else. But at the same time, um, there's maybe even hope that they'll discover us. In case of this particular star system though, because it's so close to us, it could potentially be one of those objects that we need to investigate even further. Um, a couple years ago, we discovered Proxima b, which was the closest um, terrestrial or Earth-like planet to us at a distance of just over four light years. This one is not far off. This is only about three times as distant. And the most incredible part about this particular star system is that it has two very Earth-like planets, one a little bit closer than Earth, one a little bit farther than Earth. So if one doesn't work out, maybe the other one will. And the other really important fact about this star system is that, unlike other red dwarfs, Tea Garden star is actually pretty old. It's roughly around 8 billion years old, meaning that it's no longer really that active. 
it doesn't really produce as many super flares or even regular flares anymore. And so these planets that are um, orbiting around it have a very high chance of developing atmospheres, developing liquid water, and obviously maybe even some sort of primitive or potentially advanced life. So these two planets are extremely important and their discovery is probably one of the most groundbreaking discoveries of 2019. Personally, I'm definitely looking forward to what we discover about these objects and the follow-up studies that might even be able to somehow see their atmosphere and analyze them a little bit more. Hello, wonderful person. This is Anton, and in this video, we're going to be talking about this unusual planet known as WASP-121b. This planet seems to be losing a lot of its atmosphere to the point where it creates a kind of a river like formation that you see behind it that's essentially made up of helium and hydrogen, but also metals like iron and magnesium. And that's what makes it so unusual and so weird. It's literally leaking metals into the outer space. Now, we've actually talked about this planet uh, before because it's probably one of the most well-studied exoplanets when it comes to um, its atmosphere. The first time we talked about this planet is when we discovered that there is water in the atmosphere. So, yeah, there is a lot of really interesting things here. And this discovery is actually part of the so-called panchromatic comparative view of exoplanet atmospheres that used quite a few various exoplanets and tried to analyze the evolution of atmospheres in all sorts of unusual planets, including these ones that are known as hot Jupiters. Now, WASP-121 is a super weird planet compared to anything we have here in the solar system. First of all, this is known as a hot Jupiter. It's an object that's more massive and larger in size than Jupiter. So here's roughly how it compares to Jupiter that's on your left. And this is sort of what it looks like, except that we think it's also a lot longer in shape. In other words, it's sort of stretched because if you look on the other side of the planet, you'll notice that it's extremely close to its parent star, WASP-121. And because of this, it's actively being stretched by the tidal effects from the star, turning it into a kind of a melon-like formation or melon-like shape. So basically, this is a super weird object, and it's right on the limit of tidal breaking point, meaning that it might even fall apart completely. And by the way, here is how Earth compares to all of this. There is a tiny planet Earth in comparison to WASP-121b. Now, the main purpose of this study is to actually try to analyze the primordial atmospheres of planets so we can learn how planets like Earth are formed and how they acquire their atmospheres and how they evolve atmospheres. But to learn all that, we need to take a look at these ancient giants known as hot Jupiters and various other exoplanets that we just don't have here in the solar system. So in order to learn all of this, the scientists had to take a look at WASP-121b at this position. When it passes in front of the star, we can actually zoom in to the location right here and see the atmospheric composition by looking at the light as it passes through the layer in between the planetary surface and the star itself. And what the scientists discovered this time is that not only does it have water and helium and hydrogen like most gas giants, it also seems to possess metals in the atmosphere that are actively being stripped from the planet and turned into this river-like formation behind the planet. So there is literally a river of metal coming from the planet itself. Now, the mechanism is still not entirely understood, but the scientists think that the way that this happens is Due to the amount of hydrogen and helium that this planet loses, some of those molecules of hydrogen and helium actually grab the metal molecules and basically take them for a ride, making them escape the atmosphere of the planet and uh, making them leave the planet, forming this beautiful tail-like formation behind the planet. As you can probably imagine, it's a very efficient way of losing mass for the planet. So we think that um, in a few million years, there's going to be basically no atmosphere left, and it might become what's known as a Ketonian planet. These are types of planets that have nothing but the core of the actual gas giant left after the star burns everything from the surface, all of the atmosphere is gone, all of the lighter particles are gone as well, and only the super heavy, super thick, and super dense core is left behind. And Ketonian planets have um, only been a hypothesis. We haven't really discovered ones where we can confirm for a fact that it's a Ketonian planet, but it's a very interesting concept. And we think that this is kind of what happens to many of these hot Jupiters that we discovered in our galaxy so far. 
because they do have to at some point stop losing mass and either basically get destroyed and then fall into the star or possibly turn into this unusual object known as a Ketonian planet. And interestingly, one of the main reasons why this unusual planet is losing so many different materials and specifically metals, which we've never seen before, is not really because it's hot or because it's so close to the star, but for two main reasons. One of them is um, that it's actually kind of stretched, like I mentioned, it's tidally disrupted. And the other main reason is that because it's poofed up, it's basically larger in size than it should be. So as you can see, Jupiter is smaller in size, this planet is larger, and because of this, its density is lower, and because of that, its surface gravity is lower. As a matter of fact, the surface gravity of this planet is just a little bit higher than the surface gravity of planet Earth. Which is one of the main reasons I even put Earth for comparison here, because the gravity here on the surface is pretty much similar, or just a little bit lower, than the gravity you would experience by standing on the surface of the planet that's much, much larger and more massive. And so by standing right here on the surface of this planet, you'll experience about 11.1 meters per second square of gravitational attraction, whereas on our beautiful planet Earth, it's roughly around 9.8. So the actual difference is quite minuscule. But the main difference, of course, is that this object is a lot hotter and doesn't really have a surface to stand on. And we also believe that by losing these metals um, from its atmosphere and by having a lot of magnesium and iron very close to the um, upper atmosphere here, the star becomes more opaque. It doesn't actually uh, let through as much ultraviolet light anymore and thus heats up even more, reaching uh, temperatures of roughly around 2500 degrees Celsius. That is pretty hot. That's basically 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, we're still not entirely sure how all of this will end and what's going to happen to this unusual exoplanet, but there are several possible resolutions. One of them is, of course, that this planet becomes a Ketonian planet, like I mentioned. The other resolution is, well, maybe, just maybe, it falls apart and turns into a ring formation around the star. But the third resolution is that, well, it could get swallowed by the star itself, and become part of the star, become another object that enters the star and turns into its nuclear fuel. We don't really know what happens, but I'm sure one day we'll discover another exoplanet that will be kind of like looking into the future of what happens here. In other words, we'll probably find something that will teach us what happens to these objects and how the evolution of these objects evolves with time. But before we finish this video, I wanted to try to simulate what would happen to our own Jupiter and also our own planet Earth if we were to place it just as close as the WASP-121b is from its parent star. This is WASP-121 parent star and here is how it compares to our own Sun. You can see that it's more massive, it's also larger in size, so it obviously produces a little bit more energy and more heat. So the Jupiter placed here will probably get hot pretty quickly. And with an orbit that takes roughly around 1.2 days, um, basically a single year here is only 1.2 days long, we're probably going to experience um, a very quick disintegration of our beautiful neighbor Jupiter. So let's give it some time here to get heat up and let's see what happens to this beautiful planet and then do the same with our planet Earth. Here, if I accelerate time, you'll see that um, it actually starts getting heat up pretty quickly and at some point we'll reach the same sort of temperature as uh, the exoplanet I showed you previously. And so in essence, this is kind of what it looks like um, for our own Jupiter to be around the star. But I guess it would be a lot more interesting to see what happens to our planet Earth if it's in the same position around the same star. And there you go. There is that interesting tale of material that it acquires right away. The atmosphere was literally stripped from our planet in something like three hours of real time, and it turns into a hot ball of lava. Now, this is a typical Ketonian planet. This is literally what it would look like after losing all of the atmosphere. But in this case, our planet didn't really have much to lose to begin with. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and in this video we're going to be talking about a new discovery of yet another unusual thing out there in space, and this time it seems that we've observed the creation of an actual moon around a planet. In other words, we might have discovered a first ever baby exomoon. And I wanted to start with this, this is a kind of a telescopic zoom to the location where this object is. This object was actually uh, talked about last year, it's known as PDS-70, 
because we've discovered an exoplanet there and it was very easily visible and uh, was confirmed by various sources. You're about to see it right here any second now. Now this object was obviously very interesting to us because, well, even though it's far, it's like 370 light years away from us, it does allow us to finally answer the question of creation of the solar system and creation of other stars. And this is what it sort of looks like if you zoom into it with a telescope. You can see the actual protoplanetary disk and the planet right there, very close to the star. Okay, actually very close is a relative term because the distance between the center of the star system here and the planet is pretty much the same as the distance from the sun to um, a planet like Neptune. So it is pretty far. But the protoplanetary disk is quite visible and as is the planet that's forming there. This object is also relatively young, it's only about 10 million years old, so that's why a lot of scientists started to study it. And the scientists from a university in Texas discovered something really, really cool about it. They discovered that, well, first of all, there are two planets now, and that it seems to be absorbing a lot of nearby hydrogen and creating a kind of a disk within a disk. Basically, a circumplanetary disk, very similar to what planets like Jupiter have um, next to them. In other words, it's creating a disk that might one day then form um, objects that are moons. And all of this, of course, coincides with the creation story that we have for the moons of our own um, gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn, and of course objects like Neptune and Uranus. We believe that all of this obviously starts um, after the so-called giant molecular cloud from which stars and planets form has already collapsed and created the protoplanetary disk, which we can sort of recreate right here in Universe Sandbox, and then this protoplanetary disk uh, starts forming clumps of objects that will eventually form protoplanets and that will then form planets. Some of these clumps will be large enough and massive enough, uh, usually over 10 or so masses of Earth, to create a kind of a core-like object that will start producing a gap in this particular ring. And this gap will start growing larger and larger as this object absorbs more and more of this protoplanetary dust. But eventually it will also start kind of gathering these particles around itself and these particles will literally form another ring around this object. And as this planet grows bigger and bigger, it will also have bigger and bigger ring. And so there's literally a kind of a system within the system where this will then start forming into moons that are similar to moons like the one you see right here or the moons of Jupiter that we all know, Io, Ganymede, Europa and Callisto. Um, all of these moons we believe were formed this way and this is kind of how we think usually X moons would form as well. And we weren't really sure until we saw evidence and by looking at the system PDS-70 and looking at what's happening here, with a little bit of a ring forming right there, we're now almost certain that this is exactly how it happens. And all of this is of course possible because no disk is perfect and every disk is going to have some sort of imperfection and higher density in certain regions that will then collapse and create larger and larger objects. So um, if the disk was obviously perfect, none of this would happen. But because of these imperfections, eventually they create these objects that we call planets. Now, as you can see here, there are two planets. One of them is uh, PDS-70C at a distance of roughly around uh, 30 astronomical units from the center. But this one here is a little bit closer and um, it's called 70B and it has something unusual coming off it. And the scientists behind this paper refer to this as an anomaly. There's a very unusual tail-like formation that they've detected um, very close to this planet that seems to be like its own entity now. It's behaving as if it's basically some kind of a protoplanetary um, cloud or something related to a very large, very massive collection of protoplanetary mass in a sense. But we don't really know how to explain it, why it's formed and why this object doesn't seem to have the same kind of a formation around it as its partner planet. So in other words, even though we answered one question, once again we kind of ended up having a lot more questions as a result of this observation. Uh, on the other hand, it's also very interesting to know how exactly they were able to discover all of this. And to be able to see this, 
The scientists behind this paper had to not only look at this planet with visual light, but they also had to look at it with infrared light, and also by looking at the very specific spectrum of hydrogen. So in other words, they were looking at it from three different perspectives, and then combined all of them to see, instead of just this, this. The three observations that they performed allowed them to see what we didn't really see before, and they also created this new technique that will allow us to use this in other objects around the galaxy, and most likely help us discover other very unusual objects out there. We also learn a little bit more about these planets as well. We know that uh, this object is anywhere from 1 to maybe 10 masses of Jupiter, so it's a very, very massive planet, as is this one. And the star itself is not as massive as our Sun, it's only about 90% the mass of the Sun. So there's a very, very large possibility for PDS-70C to have very large planetary-sized moons, possibly even mass of Earth. But because this system is still very, very young, it's only 10 million years old, and because all of this is still sort of evolving and is happening basically in real time, we don't really know what's going to happen there in the next billion years or so. For all we know, this planet, uh, this tremendously massive planet, is going to turn into a hot Jupiter and eventually either fall into the star or get rejected by the star system and become its own sort of massive brown dwarf-like object. So I guess for now, uh, the most important part of the study is that we've discovered uh, what seems to be the first ever formation of the exomoon somewhere out there in the galaxy. And at the same time, we've discovered a new interesting technique that we can use later on in the future to study various exoplanets and various star systems. We can now look at uh, the same object using optical uh, telescopes, we can look at it using a very specific infrared um, telescope, and also by using a hydrogen spectrum analysis to try to see the whole picture while looking at the star system and then possibly see what's happening there in a lot more detail than previously. So in other words, this officially makes PDS-70 one of the most exciting star systems out there, allowing us to study the history of our own solar system, but also allowing us to answer mysteries of the universe that we couldn't really answer before. Hello wonderful person, this is Andon, and this right here is yet again one of the very mysterious stars that was recently described and explained by science. Today we're going to be talking about this system known as NGTS-7, and what the scientists discovered here for the first time ever. First of all, what you're looking at is a very interesting binary system. Well, actually, this is not the binary system itself. This right here is a brown dwarf that you can see in front of me that orbits an M-type star, also known as a red dwarf. These stars are the most common stars in our solar system, with the nearest one being Proxima Centauri. If I were to zoom out here, you'll see that these two objects orbit next to each other relatively close to each other, and they do so in a very unusual manner. But let's not rush into things, and let me first explain to you why this system is so unusual. So first of all, this is actually kind of far away. It's roughly around 400 light years away from us, and when the scientists were just looking at the system from a distance, because these are um, red dwarfs and are not generally really bright, what they were seeing was essentially something like this. It was a single star. but some scientists decided to zoom in a little bit and they realized that there was a binary star system here with a very large brown dwarf orbiting around one of the stars. In other words, it looked something like this. We have the main star, NGTSA, orbited by a relatively large um, brown dwarf with a mass of roughly around 62 to possibly even more masses of Jupiter, then we have the partner star, and the partner star, known as NGTS-B, orbits at a distance. And altogether, this creates a very interesting and very unusual phenomenon. And this is kind of what the scientists were confused about. And this is actually why they decided to zoom into the star to begin with. It's because it was blinking at them in a very predictable pattern every 16.2 hours. This is how they discovered the brown dwarf. But the mystery did not stop there. The mystery was actually in seeing other unusual blinking patterns every 16.2 hours as well. In other words, something else was also causing the star to lose luminosity a little bit. And they suspected that this something may have been the 
beautiful spots that you see on the surface of the star, these so-called sunspots. These are of course uh, formed by the incredibly strong magnetic field on the surface of the star. But to have such strong magnetic fields, to have such strong magnetic lines, this star has to be spinning really fast. And that's when they started to realize something incredible was happening here. And what was happening here was that both the star and the brown dwarf were tidally locked to each other. They were literally always facing each other. And this is something that we've never seen before. That's because this brown dwarf is massive enough to have accelerated the rotation or the spin of the star. It made it spin faster over time. And what's even more interesting is that because of that other object, the far away but lonely object known as NGTSB, it's slowly causing the brown dwarf to fall into the main star, thus accelerating its rotation even more. So in other words, what's really happening here is uh, described by a so-called Kozai phenomenon or Kozai mechanism. You can check out more about it above my head. But in short, that other star is causing the brown dwarf to slowly make its way closer and closer to the star. And obviously it's going to lose a lot of mass in the process, as it's already doing. But here, every time it moves closer and closer, it's going to accelerate the rotation of the star itself. And this in effect will give it even more magnetic field. It will become even more magnetic, flare up even more than it's already doing. And eventually will become one of the most magnetically active M type stars in the galaxy. In other words, eventually this effect may cause the star to spin so fast that it will either fall apart or become a ridiculously powerful source of really, really powerful flares. And today we believe that um, in about 10 million years, this planet, this brown dwarf, will probably um, eventually come so close to the star that it will either fall apart or get swallowed completely. But as it does so, the whole system will be spinning ridiculously fast. Let's try to simulate this here and let's see what happens if the planet comes really close to this object. So this discovery suggests to us that there are planets out there that are massive enough to influence the behavior of a star, to influence its rotation, and most importantly, to cause it to be more active than other stars. This star's activity is actually influenced by the very, very massive brown dwarf next to it. And we've obviously never seen anything like it. We couldn't even imagine this happening. And most importantly, we now believe that um, other stars out there may have been influenced by their own planets, and if they have a very fast rotation, maybe this is actually what happened in those systems. Now, our star, the Sun, is a very slow rotator. And so maybe, just maybe, the explanation for why it spins so slow compared to other stars is because of something similar. Maybe there was a brown dwarf that actually slowed it down instead of accelerating it. Now, that's just a speculation right now, but you never know. Now that we've seen that it's possible, we know that it could happen in other systems. And because this star system is actually kind of young, it's only about 50 million years old, so it's technically um, a star baby, or two babies, we know that eventually it will uh, evolve even more, and okay, here we go, and maybe even this will occur as well. Maybe the star will fall apart completely because it's going to be spinning so fast, with the partner right here possibly getting kicked out of the system, or possibly absorbing a lot of this matter and creating its own miniature star system. So we don't really know what's going to happen to this object in the next 10 million years, but what we do know right now as a fact is that it seems that some planets are so massive that they can influence the behavior of stars that they orbit. And being able to tidally lock a star to yourself is actually a very interesting achievement. And because this is the first time scientists have discovered something like this, it means that now we can potentially explain some of the unusual observations out there in the universe by using this specific mechanism. Now, it's very likely that we might not be around anymore to see what really happens to the star at the end, but we might see some other similar stars where this process has already happened, and so we might be able to discover something in the next few years that will help us explain how all of this evolves over time. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about supermassive black holes once again. And more specifically, we're going to discuss planets around these objects. Let's find out if it's possible for planets to exist around supermassive black holes, and welcome to Odemath. 
So this right here is a simulation with a black hole, very massive black hole, and a planet nearby. And we've actually discussed the idea of having various planets, including habitable planets around black holes, in one of the previous videos. But today we're going to talk about the idea of planets forming around black holes and actually becoming their own sort of objects, without any stars, without anything else in the vicinity. And it's a study that I recently discovered completely by accident, and you can also find it in the description below. This study doesn't really talk much about the nearby or the uh, close regions of a black hole, specifically the regions that you see right here. And it doesn't really talk about the accretion disk or any other um, regions that we normally talk about. It talks about the so-called circumnuclear region or the so-called circumnuclear disk that you can kind of see right here. And we believe that our black hole has it as well, we just don't really see it because of the perspective from which we're looking at our own black hole. But we know that these disks exist and it's actually one of the reasons why the M87 black hole, where we're zooming in right now, is so difficult to see. It's surrounded by this tremendously large disk of dust that's covering the black hole and you can only really see the black hole through the radio waves that pass through the dust quite easily. Now to help you visualize some of this, let's try to recreate some smaller parts here in Universe Sandbox, just so you can see what we're talking about. So here is a black hole, this is Sagittarius A star, the one in the middle of our own galaxy, and it's surrounded by the accretion disk. This is a much, much smaller version of the typical accretion disk, just to represent what all of this looks like. This is the matter that slowly orbits around the black hole and basically makes its way toward the center. And then at a much, much larger distance, uh, usually very, very, very far away, sometimes even several hundred light years away from here, there is another very large formation known as the circumnuclear disk. Now, right now it's very difficult to see it, but as I add more parts to it, you'll realize that it's essentially this extremely large torus shape that um, is literally hiding the black hole because of all of this dust that sort of orbits around the black hole and prevents the light from escaping it. And this very large shape, this torus shape that has uh, formed through this dust um, orbiting around the black hole, that's literally what we refer to as the circumnuclear disk. Now, the shape and the size always differs, but we know that these objects are much larger around active galaxies, specifically galaxies with active galactic nuclei. So if the black hole in the middle is very active and produces a lot of energy, spewing out a lot of gas in the process, this usually results in a much larger circumnuclear disk that is then a lot better at literally hiding the black hole. Which is why M87 is so difficult to see, because the circumnuclear disk there is very, very large. But in a typical, somewhat active galactic nuclei, specifically in a galaxy that's not really a quasar, not a very bright object, but it does have activity in the middle, there is usually enough dust here to form a disk that's around 300 to 400 light years across, and usually the mass of this disk is around 10% of the mass of the black hole. So hypothetically speaking, for our black hole, this means that it would be about 400 to maybe 500,000 masses of the sun, all concentrated in this relatively large disk. Now some parts here take about a million years to orbit, some parts will take 100 million years to orbit. So the actual orbital speed and the actual interaction between particles is very, very minute and very small. But sometimes these galaxies stay like this for a very long time. And this is what the scientists behind this paper decided to try to calculate and study. They realized that these tiny particles, these little particles that you see here, each of them eventually is going to start mixing together and eventually form bigger and bigger and bigger shapes. And at some point, this can become large enough to literally start forming planets. Now, they try to do the simulations of this and try to calculate how long this would take, and they realize that this is a very slow process. But they also realize that it's quite possible because of the conditions that are created so far away from a black hole where it's no longer really energetic, but also where there's enough material for all of this to start coming together. Now this object right here is about 100 meters or about 300 feet in radius, 
and they believed that such an object would potentially be produced within the time of AGN. In other words, for this black hole in the middle to be active, it needs about maybe 10 to roughly around 100 million years. And during this time, this could be produced. Such object could definitely be made and then have enough mass to start attracting other objects to literally grow in size quite exponentially similarly to how planets grow from a typical circumplanetary disk that we've observed in many different systems out there. Now the only main difference here of course is that it's a much slower process. There is no uh, star in the middle to kind of start influencing things but instead there's a black hole and at the same time there's probably very little interaction between objects and very very little collisions or any other disturbances. In other words, it's a very, very slow process, but it's a very methodical process and it's probably quite good at producing really, really large, really massive planets. Depending, of course, on what happens to all of this gas with time and whether this gas can continue to grow and then maybe even become a star. Now, let's actually see if we can create a tiny planet here using the material that is orbiting this black hole. And let's maybe see um, if it actually turns into a star as well. But a very important reminder from this paper is that this is a really slow process. So essentially after about 100 million years, you would expect to see maybe a planetary size object or at least a protoplanetary size object. And then maybe within about 100 more million years, you would start seeing quite a lot of um, relatively large moon-like or possibly even planet-sized objects, but obviously all of them quite far away from one another. Now, um, the dust here, for the most part, is probably only hydrogen and helium, so it's very likely that a lot of these objects would probably end up being some sort of gas giants, or at least objects similar to a typical gas giant. And um, obviously, as they grow larger and larger, there's also a chance for them to become stars. And although the theory behind this is actually pretty solid and there's definitely a lot of material out there very close to these black holes to produce these objects, the more difficult part for us would be to actually detect these objects because planets are relatively hard to see, especially so close to a black hole. And so it's very likely we're not going to be able to see these planets unless, of course, they do actually turn into an object like a brown dwarf or even better, some sort of a star, a red dwarf. If we actually do detect a young red dwarf somewhere in the vicinity of a black hole, specifically within about 300 or so light years away from it, and it's a star that was just born, it's probably something that was created in this way, and this would definitely be a very solid proof of this particular hypothesis. But for now, it's unfortunately only a hypothesis based on simulations and, I guess, based on relatively solid math and understanding of the uh, galaxy. But even though in this particular simulation this star is relatively close to the black hole and all of the planets that have been creating are also very close, we believe that for a typical supermassive black hole this can only start happening on the outskirts or past the outskirts of the so-called snow line. And for a black hole like this one, this snow line is really far away. And let me show you how far away it is. It is at least 5 light years um, away from the center which is basically somewhere over here. It's actually even more than that because the black hole we're using is more massive. So this is roughly where the so-called snow line is and past that we could potentially produce these planets. But within this radius it's just not really possible because the black hole is too energetic and produces way way too many emissions for the circumnuclear disk to produce anything that's uh, capable of creating planets or of course stars. And what's more, once the black hole is no longer active, similar to the black hole in the middle of our own galaxy, we don't really know what happens. We believe that this gas does sort of eventually dissipate and probably escape into the rest of the galaxy, traveling across the galaxy, possibly combining with other dust clouds and maybe even falling onto planets like planet Earth but we don't think that it um, becomes a planet or a star by itself. As a matter of fact, we think that maybe some of this gas escapes the galaxy completely and then becomes the so-called intergalactic dust, especially if this gas moves really, really fast. But for now, we don't really know. We know that the dust interaction 
and also the particle interaction within galaxies and between galaxies is very complex. We're still learning quite a lot about it. As a matter of fact, I'm currently making a video about the intergalactic dust that's going to come out really soon. Or maybe it has already come out if you're watching this in the future. But for now, that's really all I wanted to mention in this video and basically, just to give an idea, we think that in this region right here, roughly around 200 to maybe 300 light years away from a black hole, we could have planets form completely by themselves, especially if the galaxy is not too active, but also not too quiet. Specifically galaxies like the beautiful galaxy Centaurus A that you see right here, that's one of the most beautiful galaxies out there and is um, basically the closest such galaxy to us. Here there might be planets forming. And if we actually have a powerful enough radio telescope, specifically the telescope that allowed us to take a picture of M87 black hole, we might be able to use similar technology to look around the black hole and discover radio pulses coming from these planets. But this is not something we'll be doing anytime soon and it will probably take a few years before such mission will even begin. For now though, it's definitely a really interesting idea and if one day we discover a planet somewhere on the outskirts of a black hole, it's probably going to be around this galaxy right here. On that note, that's all I wanted to mention, come back tomorrow to learn something else, subscribe if you still haven't and share this with someone who enjoys learning about space and sciences, and maybe even support this channel on Patreon because it does help me quite a lot. I'll see you tomorrow, come back tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye bye.